Welcome. I'm Jim Falk, and thanks for being with us. There's a lot of controversy about drones and how we use them, and that's what we're going to talk about today. These unmanned aerial vehicles are now considered essential instruments of war. Their flights are often controlled from as far away as 7,000 miles. Even though their targets may be in Afghanistan or somewhere else, raises critical legal, ethical, and moral questions. So let's welcome two experts who have given considerable thought to the future of warfare. Joining us from the United Kingdom is Dr. Brianna Rosen. She's a senior fellow at Just Security and visiting fellow at the Oxford Institute of Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict. During the Obama administration, she worked both at the National Security Council and the office of the vice president. Also joining us is Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Chapa. He's a senior pilot with the U.S. Air Force. He earned his doctorate in philosophy from the University of Oxford and is the author of Is Remote Warfare Moral? Weighing Issues of Life and Death from 7,000 Miles. A warm welcome to both of you. Let's get started with you, Brianna, to sort of set the stage. Why is drone warfare so controversial? It would seem to me that it's inexpensive. Pilots are not certainly at the same risk in, in an unmanned vehicle. So why so much discussion about it? Thanks, Jim. That's an excellent question. And thank you for having me on the show. So. I'll, I'll outline briefly four reasons why the drone program continues to be controversial, although there are many more beyond. Um, this is a matter of authorization and consent. So this question of author authorization and consent has plagued U.S. operations in the war on terror for nearly two decades. Um, the question is, have the American people authorized uh, these, uh, the use of force where drone strikes are often used against these groups overseas? Um, and if not, you know, this type of, this force is being used in their name and why are elected officials um, resorting to such strikes without proper authorization and consent? So from a domestic legal perspective, the executive branch has long relied on the now outdated 2001 authorization for use of military force, which was passed immediately following uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And, and that authorization from Congress was specifically to target the perpetrators of those attacks. But what we've seen in the past two decades is that um, the executive branch has interpreted that authority in ever expanding ways um, such that the list of targets, the list of groups that we have been targeting under that authority has expanded significantly beyond Al Qaeda um, and the Taliban. And, and it's, it's, it's including uh, the full list of groups in fact is classified under the 2001 AUMF. So this is important and it's problematic because what it means is that you know, Americans that are alive today, um, many of them were, were, were young um, teenagers at the time of 9-11. They may not even remember the 9-11 attack, but uh, drone strikes and, and other instances of the use of force are still being carried out against uh, not state actors overseas under these outdated authorities that remain in place and that may be used to justify the use of force against an expanding list of groups that is classified and which the American people don't have insight into. Um, another key reason why this is controversial concerns the issue of necessity and using force as a last resort and this idea that we will only use force if there is a, a threat that is temporally imminent. This idea of imminence has really been stretched beyond recognition in the past two decades where um, in a, a threat no longer has to be immediately imminent in order for us to resort to force and self-defense. Um, and so what it seems like increasingly is that you know, the administration, uh, and this is a problem for all U.S. administrations, Republican and Democratic alike, um, since 9-11. Um, it seems that in many ways, killing has become almost a policy of first resort. Um, right. And that, you know, targeted killing is what, what they rely on as a well, I want to get into a lot more considering alternatives. Let me, let me just jump and interrupt just for a moment, because I want to get into a lot more detail about that, because those are such important issues. And you certainly <laughs> explain why it's so controversial. Joe, I found in your book very helpful just to get sort of a foundation on what drones are. We all have this sort of imagination of, of what we see every so often on television or our kids are flying drones. How many people are involved in keeping a, a drone uh, in, in flight? Because in reality, they're not unmanned. That's right, Jim. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. And I hope we get to come back to some of what Brianna had raised. I think uh, I think those are- Oh, we definitely will. Also. We definitely will. 
Yeah, so first let me just say, though I am a US Air Force officer, the views I express here are my own and they don't necessarily reflect the, the DOD or the Department of the Air Force. So when we talk about drones, it's actually, it's actually more and more difficult over time to figure out what we mean by that word. And this goes right back to the beginning of the Predator program. Uh, the Predator, the first armed uh, Predator uh, sortie was on, uh, on the opening night of the US and Allied war in Afghanistan. So we can trace the history of the armed Predator right back to the history of what was sometimes called the global war on terror. So they kind of share a lineage, the Predator and, uh, and our wars of uh, counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. And even then, that use of the word drone was controversial within the remotely piloted aircraft community because it seemed to suggest that there was something autonomous about these systems. When people hear the word drone, they might think that there's no pilot involved at all, when in fact, as you say, there are several people involved. So in the, in the book, what I'm really focused on is the Predator and Reaper in the United States, but also in some allied countries. And the Predator and Reaper are by no means autonomous. They have a qualified crew flown by a pilot and a sensor operator. The pilot sits in the left seat and has command authority for the entire sortie, the airplane and everything on it. And then the sensor operator sits in the right seat. That's typically an enlisted crew member, uh, air crew member. And that person is responsible for the sensor ball and all of the all of the lasers and cameras on that sensor ball. So one way to think about that is that this crew of two manages the manages the sortie. Um, the pilot's responsible for everything. And when it comes to releasing a weapon, the sensor operator is actually the one that that manages that laser that guides the missile to the target. So both crucial crew members. But now think about how many crew members you would need to to staff a squadron. These airplanes stay aloft for roughly 22 hours on end. So let's just Let's just, uh, let's just assume that's 24 because it makes the math easier. In a 24-hour sortie, even if I have those crew members fly eight-hour shifts, which is a long time to be able to sort of stay in, engaged and, and pay attention for eight full hours, I still need now six crew members to make up that one 24-hour sortie because I need three eight-hour shifts. And that assumes no vacations, no weekends, no, no sending people off to their professional military education. So that number really starts to add up. And so what we found in the community over the time is that to get to a sustainable, uh, a sustainable pace, we need about 10 pilots and 10 sensor operators, as well as the intelligence analysts that come along with that for every one 24 hour sortie. That's a lot. Um, so if we uh, have a squadron that has um, that has five airplanes airborne at any given time. We're looking at roughly 50 of each crew member. That's a 100 to 150 person squadron just to fly those five airplanes. So it's by no means unmanned. There's a lot of humanity that goes into it. And I haven't even said anything about uh, the maintenance. I mentioned intelligence, but that's a big part of it. Well, by the time you look at the entire apparatus, so it's, it's hundreds of people uh, that go into making that one, that one airplane airborne at any given time. Tell us a little bit more about the chain of command, because I, I suspect many of our viewers saw a movie that came out a few years ago with Helen Mirren, Eye of the Sky, and it certainly was suspenseful, but that's not really, is it, how the chain of command might be followed here in the United States? That's right. I think that the, one of the things that made that film interesting was the interplay between the different countries. So I'm going to focus just on the United States to make it a little bit simpler. But in the United States, uh, ever since the reorganization under Goldwater Nichols, we have unified combatant commands. So United States Central Command, for instance, is a geographically defined joint command, meaning all the services participate in that command. And so the command chain doesn't go through services like the Air Force or the Navy, but it does go through components like the air component or the land component. And so if I'm an airman flying an Air Force airplane in, uh, in a combat operation, my command chain goes up from my airplane to my deployed, that is expeditionary squadron commander, the expeditionary group, to the expeditionary wing, to the joint or combined forces air component commander, which in CENTCOM is a three-star. And that's all the air power chain of command. It doesn't cross into the joint world until we get to the four-star level and that, that uh, unified combatant command commander. Well, now that same chain of command is happening on the land component side. So if I'm supporting an army soldier on the ground, let's say a ground force commander who might be an army captain, he or she also has their chain of command that's going to go through their battalion and their brigade, et cetera, up to the land force component commander, who's a three star. Now, what that means is that when we get to the bottom of that command chain, I am an airman. I have my boss. The ground force commander is a, is a soldier. He or she has their boss. And so there's not really a hierarchical relationship between the, the pilot in command and the ground force commander. Instead, they're more like a team that have to come to an agreed, uh, agreed upon decision to release a weapon. So you could think of it as kind of, you know, two uh, missileers in a, in a nuclear missile silo where both of them have to turn the keys in order to release a weapon. 
It's kind of like that. The ground force commander has to say, I consent to have a weapon released on my, uh, on my territory that I'm responsible for. And the pilot has to say, I am willing to release this weapon. So it's really a team effort. And I think the most important part about that relationship is that the ground force commander can't give me orders. And what that means is if I get a, a request for a weapon that I think is, uh, is not morally justified, even if it might be justifiable under the law, then I'm permitted to say, you know what, this doesn't feel right. I'm not going to squeeze the trigger. And by doing that, I'm not putting myself in, uh, in uniform code of military justice territory where I might be disobeying a lawful order because that person can't give me an order. That order would have to come from my squadron commander. So I tell some stories in the book about times where there was tension between the ground force commander asking for a weapon and a predator or reaper pilot saying, you know, this doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm not comfortable releasing this weapon. And then it sort of gets elevated up that air component chain of command that I mentioned. And I think that's a feature rather than a bug of our, of our military system that we get two commanders that both have to agree to release that weapon in a close air support environment. Very interesting. Brianna, you touched on this, but recently, I guess it was late last fall, uh, there was a new presidential policy memorandum uh, issued by the Biden White House, which was classified, but a lot of it's been leaked. What was in that policy memorandum regarding the authorization to use force with drones and, and targeted killing? Yeah, I think it's, it's extremely important to get into that. And I would stress that, the, so the PPM, which is, is really Biden's drone playbook, but what it is is policy guidance for both for direct action, which includes both drone strikes and um, counterterrorism raids. Uh, what I would stress is that it's not a sea change in U.S. policy. Uh, there are some differences between the Obama and the Trump era guidance, which I can get into later, but um, it doesn't represent really significant progress in terms of um, ending the forever war, as it's often referred to, the global armed conflict against terrorist groups. Um, and but I want to just briefly go back to, to a question that you asked in the beginning, Jim, because I think it's important to stress for your viewers that it's not the drone program itself that's controversial. This is not fundamentally about the technology, but rather the ways in which it is used. Um, and, and the ways in which this technology is used raise particular moral, legal and policy questions that we're discussing here today. Um, and it's not riskless in the way that people commonly assume. What it is, in fact, is you're holding an, another group of people, the people living outside of the United States, um, perpetually at risk in a conflict which really has no end. And so one of the important moral questions that we have to consider that I hope we can get into on the program today is this issue of the morality of risk transport or the extent to which it is morally acceptable to put foreign civilians at increased risk in order to decrease the risk to American lives. So I, I just want to push back against what you said at the beginning, that this is a riskless form of warfare because in fact the risks are, are but, very high. But isn't that one of the fundamental people. isn't that one of the fundamental changes we're seeing with the Biden policy where there has to be near certainty of the target and to do everything you can to reduce collateral damage, i.e. civilians being injured or, or killed. Joe? So I, th I think that's right. I, I want to uh, emphasize the distinction that Brianna's made between the um, the morality of sort of the technology, the crew, the remoteness, and then the morality of, of the, the U.S. targeting policy. I think oftentimes when people are critical of U.S. targeting policy, they tend to aim that criticism at the remotely piloted aircraft program. And I think that's a, I think that's a category error. So you could imagine, right, anytime someone makes a criticism of, of U.S. targeting policy, the question I would want to ask is, okay, but what if we used an F-16 instead of an MQ-9 Reaper? Does that make it any better? If the answer is no, that doesn't make it morally any better, well, then it's a concern about, uh, about the policy. If the answer is yes, that would be morally different because, for instance, that F-16 pilot faces more risk than the Reaper pilot, et cetera. Well, now we're talking about the things I'm concerned with in the book about the actual morality of remote warfare and what that has to do with, uh, with distance and war. So I, I think that distinction is really important. And I do think that, uh, that Brianna raises, a, raises an important challenge um, in talking about how we, how we employ these tools as a society. And I would just say from a just war perspective, it is absolutely important to me that when we consider the principle of proportionality, which requires that we, from a moral perspective, it means that the good to be achieved has to significantly outweigh the, the weighted moral harm that we're going to cause. I think it's crucial that we include harm to civilians in that proportionality calculus. It's not merely a weighing of risk to one's own forces and the harm that we would cause to enemy combatants. 
It's weighing risk to one's own forces, mission objectives, and also enemy combatants and civilians. And I just think that that's a fundamental uh, principle of just war thinking. Well, let me get you both. I'm going to put you on the spot and let's talk about a targeted killing, assassination, whatever term we're going to use of the leader of Al Qaeda just a few months ago in Afghanistan. Was that legally justified? I'll ask you that first. And then was it morally justified? Brianna? So, I mean, it, the answer, as, as most lawyers will tell you, is that it depends. I mean, in, in one sense, these counterterrorism op operations represent uh, a big success. Well, I'm asking for, you about a specific US. case. Yeah, so it falls within widely accepted legal authorities um, and theories that have guided U.S. context for the past two decades. Um, but this case uh, simultaneously demonstrates just how flawed and strained those very same theories are. So, as, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, the domestic legal authority for this is the 2001 AUMF, which, uh, depending on, on who you, you talk to, um, you know, this is an outdated authorization that should have been repealed or repealed and replaced a long time ago. So um, these, it's relying on stretched interpretations of legal theories that uh, are very much in dispute. Um, and, and then from an international legal perspective, it's relying on this issue of, of self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. So I think that the legal justification um, is very, it's open to debate, it's controversial. Many U.S. lawyers will tell you it is legal under the 2001 AUMF. Um, but again, these statutes have been on the books for a long time, and many would argue that, that the global war on terror should have ended a long time ago. The 2001 AUMF should no longer be the legal basis for the authorization of these types of operations, particularly since we have um, killed so many of these senior Al Qaeda and ISIS leaders. So this raises the key question, which is another reason why these operations are so controversial, which Joe, is how, how when do you does see it, Joe? the global armed conflict end? Joe, how do you see yeah, it? I, I agree with that. I agree with a lot of what Brianna just said about the, the law. So um, I first want to say I'm not an expert on, on U.S. or international law. I come at this from a just war thinking perspective. But I will say that the, the challenge is that the AUMF does still stand as the legal justification, domestically speaking. And this seems to fit under that, that uh, authorization. In fact, lots of criticisms of the AUMF point to the and its affiliates clause, right? So the AUMF justifies the use of force against Al Qaeda and its affiliates. And when sometimes the criticism is that the U.S. has interpreted that set of affiliates far too broadly. In this case, however, the case you raise, this was a leader of Al Qaeda, which was the central organization around which the, the 2001 war in Afghanistan began. So, so it seems to fit within the, the category of Al Qaeda rather than affiliates. Now, if, I'm, if I could move to the moral question, I would want to ask questions about um, necessity or precaution or minimal harm, depending on what theorists you talk to, you get different terms. But the question I would want to ask is, even though we recognize that this was a member and in fact a senior leader within the organization, is it necessary to kill him? Is this the, is this the, uh, the least harmful means of achieving military objectives? I sometimes wonder if we don't have more of a, a retributive uh, retributivist approach to some of these questions, right? Are we trying to punish members of Al Qaeda for the harm that they did in 2001 and in the years that followed? Or are we trying to prevent future harms? The kind of just war theory that I do suggests that the only moral justification we have for causing harm is preventing future harms. And so I want to, if I cast it in that light, I would want to ask hard questions about whether this person still poses the threat uh, that they did perhaps in the years previous to justify killing him to prevent the future harm that he might cause. I don't know the answer. I suspect the answer is classified, but that's how I would want to frame the question. Brianna, you, you've mentioned a few times the authorization to use military force, and it is an important issue. And I, I do wonder why it's now been over 20 years that we're still operating under that policy. Tell us if you can, within about 30, 45 seconds, why hasn't it been modified? It's simply a lack of political will, Jim, because, you know, Congress is reluctant to take the steps necessary to repeal and replace the 2001 AMS because if they're afraid if they do, there might be another terrorist attack on U.S. soil and they would get the blame for that. And similarly, despite the fact that the executive branch and the Biden administration has voiced support for repealing and replacing the 2001 AMS, they just there's a lack of political will on both sides to do so. Joe, we could devote two programs to what makes a just war or a, who is a warrior. But in your own views, is a pilot of a drone the same type of warrior, deserve the same recognition for courage and patriotism and valor and so forth as someone who's flying an F-18 or an F-35 over hostile territory? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Jim. And I, I do spend some time in the book on that. One of the things that um, that prompted me to want to write this book is that in the literature on you know the ethics of quote unquote drones, oftentimes we're asked to compare the the riskless uh, in in quotes right the riskless warfare of of uh, predator and reaper where you might have an air crew that's in the continental United States and they don't face any of the combat risks that we would anticipate for traditional warriors. And then we compare that to the infantry Marine or to the soldiers who, who stormed the beaches of Normandy uh, in the Second World War. And, and of course, the asymmetry there is, is palatable, right? Of course, there's a, there's a stark asymmetry there. Um, but as a, as a professional airman, as a member of the United States Air Force, I tend not to compare remote warfare to the infantry Marine. I tend to compare, just as you ask, the remote warfare to more traditionally piloted uh, aircraft. That, that's the, the closest point of comparison. I think that's the right way to frame it. So I, I don't want to say that traditional pilots don't face risk or that they don't have courage. I don't want to get in that kind of a, a competition, you know, an inter-service rivalry. But I do want to point out that for the last 20 years, the physical combat risks to American aviators have been incredibly low. It's not to say that you can't have an engine failure that might cause you to have to eject, uh, maybe even be taken prisoner of war, although that's been exceedingly rare. Uh, and our adversaries over the last 20 years just haven't had the technological means to shoot down an F-18 or an F-35. And so in, uh, empirically, looking backwards 20 years, retrospectively, the combat risk facing American traditional pilots and the combat risk facing remote pilots is actually not that different. I know it doesn't look like that in a sort of forward looking sense, but retroactively, it has been the case that we have not had a single airplane shot down in the United States Air Force over the last 20 years of, of combat operations. What now, about what does that have to do with Well, I was going to ask. So what does that have to do with being a warrior? I, I think the other thing to point out is that for, for you know, 3000 years of literature on warfare, we tend to have seen people who are both willing to face combat risks and willing to take life. And because those two things happen together in tandem, we've tended to de-emphasize the willingness to take life, which I think is a crucial part of what it is to be a warrior, the willingness to take, right, to take life within proper constraints on behalf of one's political community. And I think what comes to the fore when we think about remote war fighting is that those folks do have to have that willingness. Even if they're not facing combat risk, they still have to be willing to squeeze the trigger and take human life on behalf of their political community within but the does, appropriate constraints. Does distance, does distance play a role perhaps in the psychological impact of the action? I think it does, but I think it, it it's more nuanced than we initially thought. And so there's kind of been two waves on what people think about the, the moral psychology of remote warfare. The first wave uh, was kind of the, the PlayStation mentality wave where people assumed that if you're in a trailer in the continental United States, you're gonna be emotionally disconnected from the work. You're not gonna have an emotional investment in the fact that those are human lives on the other end of the crosshairs. And we quickly learned uh, around 2008, 2009 is really when this research started that that's not the case at all. Um, in fact, there are crew members who have suffered post-traumatic stress symptoms for their participation in remote warfare. And so the second wave kind of capitalized on those relatively small numbers of post-traumatic stress cases, and then kind of assumed, well, remote warfare must be so traumatic that everybody suffers from post-traumatic stress. And that's not the case either. Uh, so our PTS rates, the rates at which uh, air crew members on Predator and Reaper would have symptoms of PTS are the same as they are in other combat aircraft. And it hovers right around four to 6%. So four to 6% of the air crew have PTS symptoms. And that's the same as you would find in the F-16 community or the gunship community, et cetera. Important so for us to remember is, that. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, the clock keeps ticking so darn fast. Brianna, let me just no ask problem. you this final question because you've, you've written a lot about this. Do our political leaders have the will to end the forever war? I don't think so, no. Um, and I don't know what it will take to do so, but uh, you know, one of the reasons that these authorities and these legal interpretations stay on the books today is because the executive branch is reluctant to tie its hands to act against these groups. So the question really is, and this is really the most dangerous, we're entering the most dangerous phase of this perpetual war now where public attention has shifted and elected officials are no longer even speaking of this tipping point like they used to, where the United States can declare victory on terror and move to an approach that relies more on law enforcement, intelligence, diplomatic and other instruments of national power to address the residual threat of transnational terrorism. So we're really at a, the United States is really at a crossroads now where its conventional wars in the Middle East have ended. The threat from terrorism has receded, at least for now. And it seems like it's time, if any, there's a time to set aside the war paradigm. 
Um, but the Biden administration simply hasn't done that. The TPM doesn't do that. Um, none of the guidance has coming out or any of the actions that Congress has taken suggest that we will set aside that war paradigm. So what we're looking at now Good. Brianna, um, I'm going to have Aurelian... to got to cut you off right now. I'm sorry. Joe, 30 seconds for your concluding thoughts. Yeah, I think these are important issues. As you can tell, there's lots more to say. Uh, I, I take very seriously Brianna's comments and the work that she does on this issue. And I just want to I want to emphasize what she's offering here that uh, if I'm speaking just as a citizen now, if there's anyone that can sort of bring discipline to the foreign policy of our elected officials, it's we, the voters. And I think we should take that obligation seriously. One of my concerns about the literature up to this point, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that it seems like some people want to put that responsibility at the feet of the RPA crews, the remotely piloted aircraft crews. And I want to defend against that. The crews will go where we tell them to go and they're going to participate in the military actions we tell them to participate in. Through our through our uh, system, and I think it's up to us, the voters, to hold our elected officials accountable to that kind that, of discipline. That's good advice. And let me just tell our audience that uh, both of you have lots of information, lots more articles on your respective websites with the book here, as well as Brianna, your work at at Oxford. So I encourage our viewers to dig in deeper because sadly we didn't have enough time to go as far as we'd like. And to all of you, thanks for so much for joining us today. We trust that the different perspectives that you've heard today will give all of us more clarity regarding the news on this very important issue. And as always, we continue talking about things that matter with people who care. Thanks to viewers like you.